Excellent. So uh, welcome everybody to this new webinar from One is to X. Um, before we start, can we get confirmation that you are able to see the screen and you are able to hear us correctly? Uh, here in the chat, let's check. Can you see the screen, uh, Kamaljit? Yeah, you can see the screen. Excellent. Thank you, Katerina, for confirming. So, thank you uh, for uh, joining us today. Welcome, everybody. I want to uh, thank you for joining us in this new webinar, which is a part of a series where we'll be discussing topics that will help you understand the world of computational design with the help from our experts here at one is 2 x So in this case, we're going to be checking out a very exciting session because we'll be able to check uh, and to see how computational design tools are being used in real time. But before we begin, I would like to start with a little introduction of our uh, panelists today. In this case, a friend of the pod. And I will share my screen here. Let me just, there you go. Today, we're going to be talking about how to build along a parametric pavilion from concept to creation. So. My name is Alat Hakes. I'll be the host of today's webinar. I am an architect and BIM coordinator from Mexico. I'm also the head of a company called Formacion Arco, which also delves into the world of BIM. And I'm also part of the One is 2 x team. And today's panelist is, like I mentioned, somebody who is well acquainted with One is 2 x and is somebody who has been with us for a couple of time. So, Kaoji Singh is an architect and computational designer based in India. He graduated from the School of Planning and Architecture in New Delhi. He has worked on various companies as an architect, including at Space Matters and Or Project, where he utilized the power of computational design in many of his projects. Currently, Kaoji is the lead mentor and associate program manager at One is 2X, where he is responsible for aiding in the development of the Master Computational Design course and also serves as a lead mentor in the parametric design course. With his expertise in computational design and parametric design, Kawaljit is passionate about leveraging technology to enhance the efficiency of our field. So thank you so much, Kawaljit, for joining us today, for taking the time to talk with us in this webinar. What are you doing? All right. Thank you, Arat. Thank you for this great uh, introduction. And uh, first off, to begin with, welcome everyone. And if possible, if you guys can switch on your cameras, if it's possible, because it looks much better to talk to people, not to blank screens. And uh, yeah, so let me just share my screen. Oh, Katrina is here. She's from the MCDC course. Hi. <laughs> I guess by the time we end this uh, session, you would be you would be supposed to be a part of the session in the MCDC course. But yeah. All right, so you've got to know what I do, where I'm from and what I'm currently doing. And I'd like to a bit, I'd like to know a bit about you guys as well. So you guys can feel free to unmute yourself and let's talk about how many of you guys are from design backgrounds. Whether it's in architecture, design, product design, anything, what, what, what are you, what's your background? Arat, can uh, learners, uh, people uh, unmute themselves? Do they have the right? Can you please check? Yeah, let me go and change that option. There we go. Now you guys are able to unmute yourselves and tell us a little bit about uh, whether you are from the sun background or why you develop in your profession. Yes, hello. I'm audible. Yeah. Hi, Isha. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm from architecture background. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're currently working or uh, practicing? or No, no. I'm a last year student. Okay. That's great. So you're currently in your academics. Uh, yes. 
All right. Anyone else? If you guys don't feel like speaking, you can just type it in the chat box. That's also fine. Hello. I just don't have an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm an architect. Mm -hmm. um, I'm based in Nigeria. Oh. Um, I'm currently practicing architect also. Oh, that's great. All right. So I just want to have an idea. If you guys could just type it in the chat box. How many of you are from the design background? Please just type design or not from design, just type something. I just want to have an idea how many, what, what's the demography of the learner people in this session today? Okay. Abhinav is from architecture. Design, design, architecture student. Katrina is from architecture. All right. Looks like most of you guys are, uh, are into architecture. And uh, some of you are students, some of you are working professionals. That's good. All right, that gives a fair amount of idea that people I'm engaging with are from the uh, similar background than mine. Okay. I want to ask you another question. Have you guys ever conceptualized your designs and built it in, built it in uh, real life ever? I know practicing architects would have, but uh, Someone in college, if you would have, uh, if you would have tried something, some projects other than college models, of course. <laughs> okay, most of you have replied as no and never on the chat by now. And if someone has ever, would you like to share your experience? How has it been? Okay, Yeni says yes. Of course, you are practicing architects. Yes, you would have. Any, any of the specific projects that you would have liked and probably used computational means somehow? Um, yes. Um, so uh, I was part of a project, um, a large auditorium, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of um, repetitiveness in the design process. And I think at some point, if um, uh, it was a parametric design, it would have helped in simplifying a lot of that um, design process. So yes. Understood, understood. I am sure you would have worked on multiple projects and they would have all had a different level of complexities and based on what way you need, you would have used the computational tools. So, Today, we are going to have a look at one of the work along pavilions where we are going to focus more on design part and a little bit about introduction towards digital fabrication and how the computational tools can be of a great help to work around these complex problems that we basically do. I'm sure you would have seen the Instagram page and the pavilion that we are going to design. But uh, I would like to now get a wider aspect towards digital fabrication where I want to know, do you guys know these built forms? Of course, you're from architecture background. Do you know these pavilions? What are they? Do you know their names or someone? Or at least you would have aspired to know how they work around, right? How do they build this? Anyone want to name any one of these? Well, okay, got a comment. Uh, a little bit. Okay, Katrina knows a bit about it. So the first one, as I remember, it's the swoosh pavilion built as a university research project. The second one is called the 80 Hertz NSW pavilion. Then there is Nature Broadwalk pavilion, third one. Fourth one, I can't recall the name at as of for now, but you can go on internet. It's a very, very famous uh, build form. All right. Now, digital fabrication is not just limited towards pavilions, of course, but you know, computational design and digital fabrication together can range up to product design or uh, towards the facade design and also towards built forms and structures like, I like these, right? What's one thing that is common in all these designs? If someone has an idea, anything, what do you think about these? 
what is one thing that is common about all these build forms that we had a look at? Parametric design, parametric design, repeating modules. Okay, interesting. They use algorithms. All right, interesting. Anything else? Very interesting answers, guys. Set of parameters are being involved. Great. That basically would uh, sum up as parametric design and processes. All right. Organic forms. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, manipulated repetitive elements. Okay. Yeah, you can find repetitive elements in some of these, probably most of these. And uh, yeah, repeating form. So basically, it sums up towards parametric design where, you know, you guys are saying, I'm sorry, I'm used to saying learners while taking the session that I'm, you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm referring you guys as well learners. <laughs> but uh, no worries. Algorithm, repetitive uh, modules, parametric design as a, you know, a part of the process and uh, organic forms and yeah, basically repetitive elements. Okay, let's see what I've listed down. Well, use of computational tools to bring design to reality is one thing that you can say. Maybe some of them had, uh, you know, repetitive modules, some of them do not, some of them, even though they have repetitive module, they are not the same, right? So yeah, to some extent it does work, but why did they use, why does it require to create such forms using a computational tool? Why not do it right away, like from a primitive tool, like SketchUp or um, AutoCAD or something like that? Since you guys are from architecture background, I'm considering you know these softwares. Why do you think that they use computational tools or they need to use parametric approach towards building these because we can change it by parameters okay so it helps you work along with an algorithm where you don't have to start the process from scratch rather you can just change certain parameters in between or you can create multiple iterations within the same algorithm creating more variation more options yes all right guys great i see you guys responding and interacting Keep it, keep it coming. And someone is saying it is easier to keep track of all the steps and change them anytime through the process. Okay. That is basically parametric approach towards it. The software lack with the complexity of exploring of design. Okay. So Isha, I think you resonate with what I uh, would have listed down. The complexity of these design or the form is as such that a regular tool would have made your life hell to get it done. And once you're done with it, if the client asks for iterations or, you know, you want to go a step ahead and try to optimize something and, you know, take it to fabrication level where you want to create fabrication drawings or something is, is the main aspect where the computational tools come to be of very handful approach towards solving this, uh, these kind of complexities. Now, one such project that I have been involved in while I was in Studio Space Matters, and uh, that was a competition entry for the Baha'i Temple. It was a, it was a, a second tier Baha'i Temple. I am not uh, sure what they call it by uh, specifically, but it was one of those complex projects where the similar approach was taken up that if computational tool is not used, this design where the idea has come from, from the architects, the, the principal architects of the firm would not come to, you know, the realization of how it is going to be. And this was a competition entry, which Studio Space Matters won in around 2019 or something. I worked on it 2018. And these are some of the views and how you can see those patterns where somewhat you can relate to the mathematical approach towards it by looking at these images and on the left you can see how they're stacked one on the other as a brick you know brick arches um, trying to spread load all across towards the foundation and on the right you can see 
um, the exploded view of the structural complexity of around it. These, you know, these this specific build form was supposed to be built from individual bricks as the modular units, which come across to be of uh, in a in a specific pattern and repetitive uh, you know, design form, where it comprised to be of the form that you saw in the first place. Now coming back to the same point, if we would have tried something like this on a you know primitive tool, it would not have been a you know very good experience to deal with the deal with the form and the approach towards the design. So on the similar ground, to manage certain complexities, we'll be using the computational design tool, which is the grasshopper within Rhino. And we are going to build our uh, pavilion, which you guys would have, of course, seen on the Instagram page or wherever you've, you, you would have received the mail. And it looks something like this. Well, it's less of a form that you're creating in a way of you know the organic form that someone referred to the examples although yes it does comprise to be as when you look at it from the outside but what it takes is a lot of mathematical approach towards it and it you know it originates from the point of view where you want to have an understanding of how to manage complexities within grasshopper and also how do you think of these designs as a is is a uh, thing that i want to you know basically focus towards. All right, so let's move on to the other slide. Yeah, so this is how it looks, the form. And this is a small explanation of the process where we create a point, we divide it into, we create a circle on it, divide it into point, uh, you know, create sine wave around the circular path, extrude lines, and create surfaces around it. In a nutshell, that's what conceptually is happening. Well, looking at it from the outside, it looks like a very straightforward approach when I try and explain in my words. But once you get into the tool, the, the level of complexities it involves to think where the limitation of a regular tool where you can use your mouse and orbit around your 3D geometry to select certain parts and do things is not available then how do you work around it? That's the, that's the first part of designing something like this. The second aspect, of course, takes you to a little bit of understanding towards how these members, when created as a form within Grasshopper and Rhino, can be uh, you know, organized in a way that it could be taken forward for fabrication. Before we jump into doing things hands-on, I want to know if you guys have ever used Grasshopper or not. And even if you have used, you can just say intermediate level, advanced level, basic level, so that I get an idea how many of you guys are at the base. Okay, a lot of you guys have never used it. That gives me an idea how to pace the session. Beginner, basic level, intermediate, okay. All right, so I get a lot of no's and uh, for those of you who have never used Grasshopper, I hope this gives you an understanding of A, it can manage a complex project within, you know, you can manage a complex project using Grasshopper. B, the complexity is something that you define as a user and there are certain things that you already need to know before you jump into doing it in Grasshopper. Yes, it's a follow along, but there would be certain time constraints that I would have to take care of. And uh, I guess you were notified that it is going to be a two hour session out of which 20 minutes are already up. So I'll try and wrap it up in one and a half hour. For those who want to stay at the end, if it exceeds, they can stay and those who want to leave, they can proceed with their work. All right. Let's open Rhino and Grasshopper. So you guys can open your uh, Rhino and Grasshopper. We're going to, we're going to have a follow along and I'll try and pace myself in a way you guys can do this process within Grasshopper uh, all by yourself. Are there any one uh, ones that 
do not have Rhino and Grasshopper installed in their system. Just you can write it in the chat. Do you guys have Rhino Grasshopper? Yes or no? Okay, Mohammed uh, Sabir Shabir has. Okay, uh, Abul Joe doesn't have. Arbitai. Oh, okay. So some of you have, some of you don't have. Well, since it's a follow along, it's a thing that you would need. And I guess it was clearly mentioned in the mail that you would require it. But it doesn't mean that you cannot participate into it and not learn from it. At least it will give you an idea of how do you work within Grasshopper. I won't be starting from the basics because it will take a long, long time if I do that. And also you won't be able to learn everything within just one and a half hours. So it is going to be a little bit of um, learning on what is happening and also how it is happening for those who are trying to follow along. Okay, so let me get to the Rhino screen of mine. One thing before we begin, you guys should be making sure of that you should have draw icons to be enabled so that if I, anyone wants to say anything, I heard someone say something. Oh, sorry, Kamalji. Uh, before we begin, I just want to know uh, everybody just quickly, if you have any question at any, any given point, please put them in the chat below. We're gonna be uh, responding to those questions as soon as we can. And also at the end of the session, we're gonna be opening a QA and a uh, panel where you can able to open up your mic and ask any questions. And if any of those questions get uh, not answered live, you will be taking uh, some emails from our experts at Winston Rex where they will be reaching out to you in order to make sure that none of those questions get unanswered. All right. So. Uh, just a heads up also, Kawajit, I think there's like the windows of Zoom that are kind of blocking some areas of the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, they're showing up as black boxes. Um, is it better now? Uh, uh, yeah, it is better now. All right, great. So yeah, so, you can go ahead now. It's all, the, all yours. All right, thank you. So guys, Let's ensure one thing before we begin in Grasshopper. I hope you would have started your Rhino and Grasshopper interface. Uh, if you don't know how to start it, just when you start Rhino under standard, click on this green icon. It will take a few seconds and a window like this would pop up. If you have it somewhere at the center, align it towards the right side. All right. One thing we need to ensure while working, uh, trying to follow along is that if you want to have your components, similar to what I see on my screen. You can just start with double clicking on the canvas, type bifocals. What it does is when it is on the canvas, it allows your components name to pop up onto a component. There is this icon at the center, which when you change from draw icon, it converts to the text of what this component is. And within display, if you just enable draw icons, it comes back. To the icon form. The second thing is draw full names. If you disable it, it will only have the initials of that component. Whereas if you have it enabled, it will uh, you know, have the full name of each of these inputs and the output on the right side. As I've said, I won't be able to cover up all the basics. So those who are aware of certain basics around it, that's great. For those who do not already know anything, they just can you know, refer to what is happening and try and understand where it can link up to anything that of your use while you want to work on your design somehow. All right, so let me get back to my presentation. We are now going to follow the build along parametric pavilion from concept to creation. And this is the form that we are going to look at. The first step that we need to do within Grasshopper involves creating a circle at a certain height. For this case, I have selected around 70.00 units and divided into 100 parts. Fairly simple and easy for those who have, uh, you know, those, those who know basics. So let's quickly jump into uh, Grasshopper interface and get that uh, started. What I like to do is I directly like to start from the canvas because if I just go on to the parts over here, it will take a while. 
So our design intent is to create a circle. So I start with the design intent where I just type in circle. And here I'm going to use circle C and R. Once you click on it, the component will drop onto the canvas. And there are certain inputs that this particular component requires. And uh, it's orange in color because the required inputs are not yet fed to it. Once it is fed, it will turn into white uh, component. So let's quickly provide it certain inputs. It needs a point. And as some of you might be aware of it, that while working within Grasshopper, you cannot actually select the geometry. It's a projection of it. So let's quickly construct a point. We just type construct point. And the first icon that you see over here, you can just click on it to create a point, basically. OK, so. Shavir has said something in computational architecture. We only uh, we work only on form of a building, and we can work on detail of the etc. as well. Well, it's it's open ended where you can design your algorithm as such, where you can use it. Of course, the BIM processes are much better uh, on those fronts. Arath here knows BIM better than me, so probably by the end of the session, he can probably uh, also talk about a bit about how he uses BIM processes in doing that. But yeah, it's not that great to get into the each detail of um, uh, what, what do I say? Each detail of designing things in Grasshopper. There are better tools to do that once you're done with your design within Grasshopper. OK, getting back. I want to construct a point where, as I look at the presentation, create a circle at a height of 70 units and divided into certain parts. All right. For x and y coordinate, I don't want my point to be floating here and there. So I'll just keep it zero. By default, it's zero. I double click on the canvas, hit zero, and it says number slider and hit enter. A number slider pops up between the range of zero to 100. Or I can just, do, just double click and uh, type two forward slashes. It'll give me a panel, double click on it, zero. Click outside, and you can use that as well to create the x and y coordinates. But for the z coordinates, as it needs to be at a certain height, I would just double click and type 70.00 and give this as a value to the z input. And as I can see, a projection of point on the I know, interface is depicting the output of this particular component, which can be used to create circle. And as you can see, once I provided the input, it has turned from orange to white, which means that bare minimum inputs that it requires are now fulfilled, and it is now processing information. And it has created a small circle with radius 1. It says one locally defined value as 1. Let's consider a radius of 200 units for the circle. So I double click on canvas and type 200, hit enter, I get the number slider, All right? This goes in as the radius and normal by default is Z axis, which is fine. If you want to be really particular about it, just you can type Z and unit Z is the input that you need to put in. Great, so by now you would have had a circle at this certain height and uh, now the next step that it involves is to divide it into certain number of segments. So I'll be using divide curve where the circle is in a way a curve that can be given as an input to the divide curve. The count by default is 10 quantities and uh, it gives certain points as an output which you can anytime attach a panel and read through it. So 0 to 9, uh, 10 points. These are the values which are basically defining the coordinates of each point. So don't worry if you see this to be very complex to read. Don't worry about it. We are just concerned with how many number of points are there. All right. So the count over here, I can just mention it to be 100. Let's go by 100. And if I just expand it to see, 
okay, 0 to 99, that means these are 100 points that I'm getting as an output. Great. All right, so this is the first part where I'll just keep my screen still for a while for those who are trying to follow or those who are joined late could also keep up with it. And you know, basically you need to be aware of what things work around this. Any question by now? This was fairly simple, I guess, for most of you. So, great. All right, so I guess this was simple, so we don't need to wait too long for it. Clear so far, that's great. That's good, guys. Keep on uh, updating me with how you're progressing. That helps me understand do I need to slow up or do I need to go fast, all right? So we have this divided curve uh, giving out the points that I need. Now, the tricky question here is, which I want to pose some of you if you guys know, how do we create a form which takes us to the step number two, where these points are floating up and down in a very specific format or a specific form. Anyone wants to shoot their ideas? No idea. Graph mapper. Okay, graph mapper could be a thing, but how do you ensure that wherever the point is starting, if it creates a wave, right click graph type sign, you try and expand this to an extent where you get, let's say, three of these waves. I want to create three waves. How do you ensure that this corner point is ending right at the corner where it is supposed to be? And uh, that is one of the tricky part which will not give you the right output i could take some time to explain what will happen if i use this visually but i don't think if i do that i'll have enough time to close it within the time frame that i have all right so yeah graph mapper is going to work around for a while but then at the end where the junction where the starting point of the circle and the ending point of the circle meet how do you ensure they are in the sync and in the continuous format. So graph mapper, not an option, not the best option. Sign is one of the function that we can use basically sign. Could you show grasshopper panel again? I missed something. Okay, so I'll keep my screen stable for a while. Basically, what we are trying to do is to create a sine wave. Let me just sketch it off. If you remember from the maths class that you would have ever attended in school, if you have a bunch of points laid across on a line, if the sine function is applied to it with certain amplitude, it will create a sine wave like this maximum zero minimum maximum zero minimum like that now this is on a straight line if the same thing is applied onto a circular path it will do the same and it will give you the right output as you see on the presentation over there all right so there is a something called sine function but this takes in certain values and spits out only the um, only the, uh, the the values in response to the input that it gets. You cannot add certain amplitude around it. So we are now going to use expression. And within this expression, we would need a custom formula. I'll pick this up in a while, but uh, for those who are following, just quickly reach till this point and uh, make sure you are at the same position as me. So what we need to write here is that sign, let's say you can define within the bracket any alphabet that you want, I'll put it T and I'll give it something to multiply with. So A hashtags 
sign t. This is the input that you need to type. I'll just copy it and put it in the chat box. So you can copy it and basically add to your expression. Double click on canvas, type expression. This is the one that you need to use. Or just to refer back, uh, under maths, you would have it somewhere. Expression, underscore, yeah. Paste our sign. Now, there are these inputs that need to resonate with the input values over here on the component. So if you want to change certain number values in place of A in this formula, you right click and mention and make Grasshopper aware that this A is same as what you see here. Since sine is a mathematical function, it's doing its job, it's universal. T is something that you would keep on changing as you would want to, right? So I'll just write T over here and this becomes my expression it's red at the moment saying that there is an error but this will fix in once we provide the right input value okay now what we want to do with these set of points that i have is to move them in the in the z-axis some of them goes to the positive value some of them goes to the negative value right so our design intent here is to move these points so the point input from the divide curve goes to geometry and the motion will be unit to z for now let's just keep it like that and i'll make sure that i disable these points since the factor value as an input is just one unit for it it's moving a little bit up from the it's from its original position yeah you can see the poor points at on the circle and there are the other ones that are moving in the positive z axis for one unit is something that you see floating over there all right so before we move forward let's take a few seconds to just reach up till this point because this part is going to be quite crucial to understand as a concept and let me just grab some water for myself as well all right Wow, Kamalji is back. I want to remind everybody that this webinar will be live uh, in YouTube after the session ends. So if there's something you missed, you will be able to check it out later in the website, all right? Also, I would recommend to take a screenshot of the screen as it is right now. So you can also uh, take a look more cautiously to each of these notes. And yeah, like again, like I said previously, if you have any questions, don't doubt and put them in the chat box below, all right? All right. Yeah. Thanks, Arath, for mentioning. Yeah, that's a good idea to basically take a step of it if you need it. And that will basically help you follow it in the meanwhile while I'm explaining concepts. All right. So there are certain inputs that this requires, right? We have each set of points that we need to move. These are 100 in numbers, which we defined over here. What I personally like to do is to keep this slider at the starting. I could name them to something what I want by right clicking and then typing their names. But for now, for the for the sake of time, I'll just go by the numbers as they are. So I want to create a range of numbers which in a in a in a in a listicle format could influence each one of them individually. So let me just type range. And you would find this kind of a component. Double click type range. And this is the component that you need. The second one from the bottom. Or you can even find it somewhere in the maths. Um, it is. Not sure where you can find it, but control alt and click on it, you'll find it. Yeah, it's under sets, sequence, and range. Domain is the input that it requires. So let's construct a domain. So to try 
Okay, so for this particular component, I don't want you to confuse. So go to maths, the second option at the top, go to domain and use the first one, construct domain. Because once you type construct domain, you would find a lot of these options which can be really confusing. So try and avoid it. Go to the components tab under maths, under domain, you'll find construct domain. Great. So we define a domain. And basically what domains means in this particular scenario, since we have a circle, which is 360 degree, that means two pi, and we want to influence it three times so that I get three waves. So let me just quickly type down the number slider zero less than three, or you can just type three, which is whichever works fine for you. What zero less than three does is it limits the number slider between zero and three. So you, while typing it in, you're defining where to start from and where to end while saying zero less than three. If you just type three, it will be between the range of zero to 10 and you can slide it to keep it at three. And the, the input that it requires is in the format of pi because that is going to influence the, the radiance value of moving these points, right? So for the, um, the input for domain end, we would need a multiplication component with three and you can just type two here and create a panel to multiply with this. What it basically gives out is value six. It's a basic mathematical operation. And when we say six pi, you can just type pi, which takes in the factor and goes to domain end. Yes, for the reasoning part, you would question, you would have a lot of questions of how this is happening. Why do I need to use pi? Where is this construct domain happening? Um, these are the questions which would require a lot more understanding towards mathematics and how it is used in the super. But to do the thing, it's going to be really cool as an output. You would need these. Okay. So let me just rearrange these. Okay, I'll just keep it here. Great. So the input comes in here. Domain start by default is zero, which you can define consciously by putting in a panel as well. It won't change anything. But if you want to have custom values, you can change it. For this particular example, we would have to start from zero, which means the wherever the curve is starting versus when it takes in six pi as an input, it completes the six uh, the whole circle and six pi divided by two pi means three waves. Simply put like that. If I add a panel to the range output, it gives me just 10 values, whereas the number of points that I want to influence are more than 10. Basically, these are 100. If I just expand, you would be able to read. So we need to give in certain value as these steps. And this goes into the T input. And for the A input, I can give in uh, the number value, which is from the starting of this construct point component, which is 70 units to A. And now you can see the component has turned white because all the required input are now fulfilled as what it requires. And the result goes into, for now, to factor Z. It does something to it, but what's really cool is that gives um, the kind of like the output that you need. All right, so I think this could be something to digest as too much for you guys. So let's me just quickly, yeah, there's something happening. We have a look at it, but for now, just reach up till this point to, for the people who are trying to follow up. We'll wait for another minute and we can just take a screenshot and then we look at an important aspect of this.
Okay. So someone has asked why we used 6 pi instead of 2 pi. Okay. Let's see what happens if I just remove this input and this will basically become 2 pi. Let me just uh, use this as the input to replace the pi part. What it is doing is that it is moving, uh, you know, all set of points in the z axis from the starting till the end once to complete just one bead, which goes minimum to an extent and then coming back up to go to zero. That's it. If you want three waves around it, you need to say that divide the two pi into three equal parts so that I can get three waves in one circle. All right? So that's what is happening. If I don't give in the three into two six and just I give just two as an input, which means two pi is the domain end. You're saying that do your movement by whatever range you want to do, but complete it when the two pi is completed, which means complete the whole circle and close it up. If it goes six pi, it goes divide the two pi into three parts. That's what we are doing. This is two pi and we divide it into three segments. All right. So what we are basically doing here, oh, we got it, great. We are moving these points, but you can see one small thing over here, this small point, which is not what we need uh, while working with this particular form because it can create a lot of issues at the end. So if I just add panel to it, and expand my panel. And I'll create another copy. This is just to see, you don't have to do this. This is just to understand this particular um, panel thing. You don't have to do it. Okay. So let's look at the right one. These are the values with which the points are moving in Z axis. There are zero to 100 points on the left side that we are moving by certain values in z axis all right now these points are moving the first point is moving zero units in z axis which i could say this one and maybe this one or you know the first one the the uh, the last one is also limiting itself to zero uh, value in this case what we now need to do is to Call out the part towards the last value because there are two points who are, uh, which are kind of like um, coinciding in those frames and then additional ones coming as an output. In order to remove the last entity from the values that we want to use for moving it, we can use curl uh, index. So there is this list, and I want to remove the last one. For that, I use minus one as an input. So minus one goes here, and this becomes the input for unit set. And now you can see that these points are ending at the point where they are supposed to be. All right. And I just want to quickly, quickly do one thing. List um, item and do um, minus one or minus two less than two, let's say. Just doing some checks on this. So which one is the last one? Okay, so there is the point over here, which is the last one, minus two. This is minus one. Okay, so I'm doing it on the wrong ones. It should happen somewhere here. Yeah, minus one. 0, minus 2, you can see this green highlight over here, I don't know if it will be better visible in render view, yeah, let's use the render view, the green one, minus 2, 1, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, so on and so forth. Now you can see that all the points are aligned the way they are supposed to be. Great, what we could have also done is that we could have deconstructed the point and used its x, y value as they are, and just added 
the values to Z uh, value. I think that's how I had it with the previous script, but either which way it works fine. All right. Just give me a heads up of those who have understood this part and are following it on the chat as yes or no. This will give me an idea that you know, this concept, the way I'm explaining is going fine or do I need to just uh, sober up a bit on this one. Okay. Katrina says it, it's fine. All right. I, 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 I think uh, you guys are the ones who are most a bit of grasshopper already and it's not too much for you to grasp at the beginning, I guess. All right. So for those who are not being able to follow up, don't worry. This whole session would be recorded and available on the on, on YouTube, and you can just find it on one X page. What does relay do? Okay, so relay is basically when when you double click onto a wire, it allows you to change its path, and also it can give you a another wire to spit out of it as an extension to it so that when your wires are running into each other like that you can just double click on the wire add relay and make sure they are easily readable when you're working with it well while working within grasshopper you should try and avoid all the spe spaghetti stuff and try not to keep your components like this so that you cannot follow where the information is flowing from where to where it's always it always works without the looping uh, plugins the data flows from left to right within Grasshopper. So try and maintain your components in the hierarchy of the starting components at this, on the left and the ending component towards the right. And in those processes, Relay could be of a great help to organize your script in a way. All right. So far, so good. And we are already into one hour timeline. We are down on one hour time. Great. So there is this starting point that we worked on and these are the points at the periphery which we have attained till step two let's look at this step three now what i want to do is to create a line between the point at the center and to these points and i want to basically use them as the direction for my lines to go in and out from these points right to create something like this if I within Grasshopper, if I can if I can create a, a, a set of lines, I can extract its direction and make use of it to create more lines or anything around it. Basically, you're trying to extract the vector, the unit vector around it. Now I want to ask you guys, what would you do to create these sort of lines between the starting point and all the ending points? Okay. Forgive me for my bad sketch, but you get the idea of what is happening, right? Anyone want to say what you would do? Let's go to Grasshopper, I guess. Yeah. And uh, let's try and see what happens over here. In this, I have a set of points at the wave like shape. And there was this starting point that I created. And I can simply vector line, something like two points line, okay and sdl so these are great options to start with i would go one by one on each all right so these are interesting to understand as the concept i'll go with george's comment first it says sdl that means create a line using the line sdl component this is line sdl right it requires certain starting point certain direction and length the problem is how do you know which direction is it every direction is changing right so it would be a good option to start with on a straight line where you know the direction but not in this particular case because you don't want to rely on to the numeric values to have the accuracy because that won't work fine here rather what you have in your hand um, before saying that a free these set something like two point line okay that is uh, fine and then there is um Abhinav who said vector line so lines basically as the line stl says it requires a direction which is a vector and uh, you're in a way saying the same thing but the question comes where do you define the vector when it is changing at every interval so 
tangent tangent is something so i'm going to set tangent basically happens at the every point on the circle when it is going up but it doesn't give you this when in the in the in the front view if you just look at it it is not along the yeah, along the tangent of the circle it's actually going up and down so that doesn't work someone said the right thing uh, this was let me go back afridi afridi mentioned you can create line between set of points you have one starting point and multiple points at the periphery and there's a component called line with two inputs that it requires which is start and end now there is a very important concept within grasshopper which is called data matching for those who know it's great for those who, for, for those who don't know i'll just give you a glimpse of it basically we have created this line i'll add a relay to make it readable i'd add a panel to the construct point output here i have one point which with its coordinate value we don't need to worry about its coordinate value it's just saying that there is just one item in a list and there are these hundreds of point 100 points specifically which are moving in certain direction now when you're doing an operation which is between one point and the other point to create a line between them longest list comes into play this is a concept that some of you might be familiar with some of you may be familiar with grasshopper but might not be familiar with this concept what it does is it starts with the starting point to create line between the zero point let's say this somewhere here it is zero and then it goes to the point one point two point three point four it repeats the same line component again and again till the time it reaches to exhaust all the options like this that's why in grasshopper conceptually you can also think of it in a way where one entity can interact with multiple entities because they follow certain mystical format all right so i don't expect for those who are starting grasshopper at the very first time today to know all this concept and remember it by the end of the session but at least you get an idea where certain parts of learning are required while working with this uh, with, within grasshopper all right okay so we got these lines and i need to extract directions out of it so there's a component called unit vector i think i should rush up a bit okay well shortest list will limit your interaction between the very first point and the the uh, you know the single point over here versus the the very first point of this shortest list is another concept but that will not give you all these hundreds of lines it will limit its interaction between one point on the first list and the second the first point on the second list it will not give you the other 99 lines okay so i can hide these lines for now i needed the unit vector what unit vector basically means is that if your line is 71 unit if you add unit vector to it it will give you the smallest direction with value one magnitude but the important thing here is the direction that you are using all right direction so that's why we use a uh, unit vector it's a mathematical concept when you multiply anything or add anything to a unit vector you are basically saying if i want 100 unit line the the unit vector does not influence because its magnitude is just one unit it's it doesn't have that power to change deviate from the values that you want to use all right great now at these points which are the points on this component i want to create line i have extracted the direction that i need and i want to create lines so let me just start with line sdl this time i'll use line sdl can someone tell me why what is it that we are doing at the moment which you could not do at the previous point of time to use line sdl i mentioned why line, line sdl is not a good option to go with. we have the direction yes z says yes we have the direction 
we extracted the unit vector so that we can define the direction which will help us to basically create these sort of lines all right if we just create a line with one single value all of the all of the lines will of the will be of the same length at each of these points but we'll also see how do we create the sine like wave in, in if we look at it in the top view it will also have a sine like uh, wave at the front and at the back cool so getting back to it um, we have a starting point which are coming out of the move component we have the direction and if we just zoom in i have a small line over here so for the length let me just give in some values let's say um 50 units now what it does is at each given point using the direction of the unit vector it is moving it towards the direction where the vector is going right the lines that we built over here was starting from the center point and reaching up till this, till this end point so it is radiating towards the outside that is what the unit vector is defining and it has picked up to create the lines at these points with 50 units as the value that we have provided since we have provided just one value all of them are equal now the line component well if you would have used a rectangle component you would have used um, domains which could define that if a if a rectangle has to start at a point you can create it in positive x and negative x and positive y and negative y simultaneously by defining the domain but in the case of line stl you don't have for the length as an option to use domain you can have a quick check on it um, construct domain let me just pick it up from here let's say i want to have something from minus 50 to positive 50 negative 50 to positive 50 and that goes in as the value for the length you would see by the concept it should have 50 units in the negative side 50 units in the front side uh, the positive side but it's actually not working uh, the way we expect it to be so we would need to intervene over here before we design you know define our line length let's do one thing let's move these points further to an extent towards the outside and towards the inside to create certain set of lines all right so we need to move these points and hence we use move component what we want to move are the set of points in what direction in this direction but if i just simply give the unit vector as the input it will move just one unit so if we have the direction and the unit vector, we can multiply it with any amplitude that we want. So we multiply this with some value. Um, let's move it to, for now, with a number slider of 50 units. And replace the value in motion. All right. So... We'll just keep it like that and for now i'll just keep my screen stable for those who want to take a snip or you want to do it so after the curl index we did this move for the sine wave points and this is what we have done by now you can take a snip or try and uh, follow it as in the moment i'll just take a minute all right hope you guys have taken the required snips of it or you would have 
completed this part. So what is happening, if I look at it in the top view, all my points are moving just like the sine wave, but at the equal distance, right? But if I don't want to have these to be moving at the equal distance, rather, if I would want them to be moving in some sort of a sine wave, something like this, a uh, very bad sketch, but it gives you an idea, like this, we would have to come back to the same input that we provided here with the expression, with the domain, with the range, with the pi input, like that, and use it for the value that defines the motion for these. So getting back to it, I'll create some space to add certain components here. What I'm now going to do for the ease of time, not to copy, you know, not to redo everything together, between the components where we used pi, um, zero, domain range, expression, curl index, and the panel input for this, I'm going to copy it. Control C, Control V, move it aside. This thing is going to be repeated quite a lot, so I'll make a group around it. Right click, uh, change its color, something like that. Reduce its opacity, like that, and uh, you can just play with the colors that you want to use. I'll just stick to something like a gray color for this. And for now, it just gives out certain values again, which basically would define the multiplication values over here. So one thing about the components like addition, subtraction, or multiplication is that you can zoom in and add another set of values to it. Or if I don't want to add anything, I just want to get rid of this 50 and add a value to it. I can use it to be the input for this particular component. Okay, so we got something like this. And if I just switch off the preview, the previous ones, I get something like this. Better than what we need, but not exactly what we need. All right. So we add certain relays so that you can see where the wire is coming from. Cool. So just for you guys to follow up, this is the set of points that we copied. The inputs remain to be the same as of for now. We'll need certain changes to make it right. But you guys can take a, a check with your script. Is it the same or not? By the way, for those that are joining a little bit late, um, I mentioned previously that the recording of this webinar will be available in the YouTube channel after a couple of days, maybe like one or two days after this webinar has ended. So you can go and check it out in our page. You can find this as one is two X on YouTube. And also, um, like I mentioned, if you have any questions that have gone unanswered in the live session, you will be reached out by our experts at the end of the same in order to make sure that those questions get a response in time, all right? So like I mentioned, please make sure to put your questions. And at the end, we're gonna have a Q&A live. All right, so we got something, something going on here. And we have, the set of points which are moved but you see that these are moving towards the inside we don't want to have that specifically 
you would want them to be moving towards the outside. And the value for A for as such is 70. What we can do is change it to, let's say, 45.00. Let's try something. It makes it less, a little less sharper than what it actually was. So that's a good thing. You can reduce it down to make it more closer towards your uh, circular form that you initially had. Let me just keep it back to all right. Now, since it's going towards the inside and we may not be requiring this, we can add certain set of values to it. I would say let's add 50 to the C input. Okay, so that looks too much. Let that be. Okay. Oh, this is doing a multiplication. That's why it's giving up this output. What we actually need to do is to add certain values to it. So let me just add addition with, let's say, 50 units. Let's see what it does. Okay, I understand where the problem is. So these are basically vectors that we are using. Hence, if I just multiply it with the, the numeric value, it just shows an error. So rather, what we can do is first add values towards the magnitude that is coming here, just the unit vector multiplied by this, and add certain values to it, let's say. 20, I hope 20 is enough, but we'll check. All right, did something. Let's just have a look at it from the top view. And if I just increase these, you'll see how it just goes towards the outside. In the rendered view, you're not seeing something anything below the ground level, so you just go to shaded view or wireframe view you see all the points like that. And we can also enable the starting points to begin with. All right. So it gives a fair amount of idea of how the points are moving, not just towards the outside, but also in a, in a wave-like format in response to the first one where we started out. Yes, I can understand that for you guys who are following, it could be a little bit tricky to follow it, but don't worry you will have access to all the content that you're following here after a few days as Arat has also mentioned so you can peacefully at your own pace pull it across but for now you guys can just understand what is happening if you're not being able to follow along great so we have these moved set of points and i want to create a set of line in this particular direction which is right now at the moment coming from here till here towards the outside. But if I do a negative around it, it will flip its direction towards the inside. So we can, so that, you know, from these points, I could create a line of this length where it surpasses the points at the mid, all right? So again, let me just clear this off and create the set of line and the length for this is, um, you know, the starting point basically for this line rather than the, the points towards the inside, I would prefer to choose it the way they were at the periphery. So the points at the periphery goes in as the starting of this line. And the direction, I want to switch it to negative side. from the unit vector and replace it here. And for the length, for now, let's just give it 50 units. And if I preview this, this is how it looks. I can extend it to 200 probably. All right, if I go to the top view, 
it does something but if you just have a look at it it doesn't resonate with the with the aesthetic appeal of what we saw in the reference images rather it should have been if i go back to the top view it should look something like where the lines are somewhat going uh, in this fashion so somewhere around this fashion so that this line is this long this is the maximum this is shorter this is maximum this is shorter and this is maximum somewhere like that anyone has an idea what should we do where should the should the in the script where should we add what to get it right anyone basically what we're talking about is to change the length of this uh, these set of lines in a way where they are increasing and decreasing just like the sine wave that we have initially started off with right so this number slider which is defining the line the length of the line is what is going to change and in this we are again going to use the same set of uh, parameters or the group that we created and use it again for the values that are going in of course the the values would change a bit so that we can see a difference uh, in the length let's just see how it goes let's copy the group take it up front and the values that i need to switch is this number slider and the values that I have here, if I just try and give it as the input, okay, they are going here and there, all right. But if I just add something to the to the to the uh, uh, values, let's say uh, two hundred, what it does it does something, but probably too much. and yeah these are some of the lines that we can make use of so let me just make it 120 it's fine to me yeah so what we are basically doing is that we are using the same kind of like the sign values that we have created and apply it for each of these factors where the moving of the point the line created the length of each line all these things are being controlled by the same parameter when we are trying to copy this particular group and in this thing the important aspect is to make sure that you're using the right curl index otherwise as i mentioned in the starting the the extra additional point at the starting and the end of the curve would create chaos so make sure you're doing this and we are using the right values. If I change these off, you see how they kind of like have more modulation towards the shape of it. So I can increase it to 100 and also switch this up to let's say 150 and the other one to be around 60. Let's say 60 is less. Let's go by 90. This, way, this looks uh, decent enough yeah so you can see that it's trying to get its shape the way we see in the reference images d is 4 by 65 uh, it looks decent to me now that i've created these lines the next aspect towards the design process if i go back to the presentation have successfully created these if i change certain values i'll have more depth towards the inside um, that will happen now i want to extrude these lines and when you look at it it's not just extruding in the negative z axis we are extruding towards the normal of the shape when when this particular part if i just look at this panel although it's not so uh, you know visible in this obviously visible in this uh, image 
what it does is it's not extruding here in the negative z-axis rather it's extruding towards the normal where if there was a plane between the two consecutive consecutive curves which is this curve and this curve whatever is the normal direction of this plane is where it is extruding this is where it gets a little tricky for each one of you who have also been a part of the basics of grasshopper or to a bit of intermediate level within grasshopper but this could be a great learning when you try and extract the direction and try and think of where to get the normal where all the directions and lines and curves are and are needed to move in their respective directions right so let's have a look at this part quickly if i add a panel then yeah by the way panel is a great resource to work with in grasshopper every time you work with it within grasshopper it's a great resource which you use quite often not just to create something like adding values but also to read parts from uh, you know, a set of list now very quickly i if i just type in list item i can pick up um one item from the list which is the starting uh, line it shows in green over here if i go to the render view you can easily see how it is now if i had another line next to it which is let's say value of zero one two this is two if i select these these are the two lines which i create a create a surface between using the log component this basically gives out the normal direction of a surface as the direction where this particular curve at the center should be extruded which means that the extrusion for this curve should happen in this direction which is perpendicular to the plane that i can extract out of it well doing it for just one of these is easy what happens is that if you want to work with the how should i say a multiple set of entities to do the same job you need to work within grafted list to apply one logic onto all of them so the list item and the log do the job for just one curve to extrude but rather we should focus more towards how we can um, extract these directions for extrusion for each one of them this is where the data, data tree part comes in so if i just go by shifting the list shift list this is the line the set of lines shift them by um, minus one oops sorry minus uh, okay, i need to add a panel with minus one and i'll do the same for plus one when you select it it just shows all of them but it, what it does is it just it just reallocates the position of each item in a list based on based on the amount of shift that you tell it to have now if i add a panel to it this is a flattened list like that and if i just try and create lock between them it is not going to give out the right result and hence we need to graph it before we do the locking we also look at what happens when we do graph this is one of the crucial concepts within grasshopper why we do this and what does it help us with right so i'll do a small thing over here before we move on may not need but it's better to do that and then do the simplify oh, sorry do the simplify and then do the drafting okay it doesn't it doesn't change the structure but it's okay these are five these are also five which is fine if i do loft between this set and this set i get the right surfaces which although looks like the next uh, each each uh, surface is uh, lofting between the consecutive curves but actually what it does is 
if I just select one out of one item out of it using this item, and for that I need to do a flat amount to it. What it does is that it creates a surface between alternate surfaces, uh, alternate curves, because we 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 did a shift. Uh, from the default value towards plus one, which is over here, and another shift in the list of minus one, which is over here. All right. For some of you, it would be something that you would have never heard, and it is the very first time that you are hearing it. Um, yes, it is quite uh, uh, something that you need to put in effort to understand. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to dwell onto the deeper concepts of data tree management. But uh, yeah, I mean, this this uh, particular example can only be done justice to once you know the relevant concepts. Uh, by the way. Okay, so we have these set of surfaces, and now if I want to extract the normal direction of each one of these, what I now need to do is so basically, I'll just unflatten this for now and uh, use evaluate surface. So I have the lofted surface, which I want to evaluate, and there's something called MD slider. And this goes in as it is. We can also use panel to do that. And for these specific ones, I see the panel at the periphery. Although for this example, it will still work regardless of where this, this value of the MD slider is. You can change this by moving around this point, select it and move it. But if I want it to be at the center of each one of them, I need to right click and reparameterize. This is another concept that would take, that requires certain understanding towards while we use it. Now there are certain set of outputs that it gives. One of the important ones over here is the frame, which we are going to use. Uh, probably the normals, yeah, we need the normals for which I can use as the direction for my lines to extrude. All right, so I'll just keep it here. From the line STL, we have done certain steps. If someone wants to just follow it, I'll keep my screen stable for a while. All right, let's move ahead. Any questions so far, anyone? Okay, so let's halt for a while. And uh, I just want to talk to you guys. Does it seem too overwhelming to basically follow along? Just type it in the chat box. Yes, no, maybe. You can call me Kamal, no, no need to call me sir. Yeah, I think the time span, the way I'm proceeding with it, it gets more and more complex, but um, yeah, uh, I, what, I, what should I say? It's like a lot of things are something that are happening, which needs a bit of an understanding beforehand. It's, a, I'd say, an intermediate level of the project that we are trying to do. But no worries, if you ever get a hand on the basic, you would be able to follow it along uh, at your own pace with the recordings as well. No worries. Okay, we got the direction because we extracted the normal out of here. So I can, we, I don't need to, but I'll just try the unit vector because it's just gives an idea for the direction. And it's in a grafted list. We'll, we'll have a look at it. 
and I have the certain set of lines that I have. So one thing that I can do is I want to basically extrude these lines if I just try and make these lines and I would then dry now. Align towards it. No, it's not. Basically, I want to extrude it towards the direction where it is supposed to be. Basically, this is my highest point. So I want to extrude it here like that. That's what I'm going to do. So if I if I do that, it will be you know a straight rectangle to extrude. But I, that's fine for now. That is what uh, we need to not do that again later. Extrude this and multiply multiplication with okay. So this is a grafted list because you can see the dot line, but this is not. So we might need to graft it as well. And then it goes into the base. And then this is the input. You can see something happened here. It's unit vector that is uh, defining the extrusion value and hence it's very small so we can add certain value like 20 or something okay so it's extruding in the other direction which is fine but i would want it to be towards the inside so i can add a negative direction a negative value towards the direction input Oops. And now it is extruding towards the inside. But if I if I go back and look at the, the where is the GIF that I had? Yeah. You guys can see it, right? So we created the point, we created the circle, we divided it. Once we divide it into 100 points, we create the sine wave, got the direction, created the line. And once we created the line, we want to extrude them. But one thing that you notice that these are tapered from the front and the periphery. In order to do that, we might have to make certain changes in the script so as so it can accommodate that specific angle that it is truncated shape that it is creating. So again, there are certain interventions required in between before we do the extrusion, and hence I'll disconnect this. All right, so I have these set of lines that I want to move in their normal axis. And the direction would be this. So let me just hide these previous ones. So they've moved to a certain extent. For now, I'm just using a simple value of you know, 20 units. I could also add modulations to it using the sine wave if I need. But for now, I'll just keep it 25 for now. Or maybe 30. Let's do 30. And once I move these lines along the center, I can scale them off to shrink it down to an extent where it is, let's say, half of its length. So I would use a scale uh, component. This is my geometry that I want to scale along the center, which I'll use um, point on curve. I can use other ones as well. It could be evaluate curve or curve midpoint, but I want to have flexibility of where it scales off at. Center. Okay. By a factor of let's say 0 0.50, half of its length. If I hide these and enable the initial ones, yeah, looks quite something over here, but you can see the smaller ones are half of the original length. All right. Let's get back. And if I could just increase this a bit to 0 
looks fine to me as of now. And now I can just grab the values and extrude. I could use lot as an option. So loft is a component that can allow you to loft multiple curves. And but at this particular moment, they are not lofting because another aspect of important aspect of data matching goes towards the data tree path, which if I add a panel and show it to you, you would realize that if that is not fixed, it won't give out the right output. So that thing is considered towards the four, it's the data tree path, which once you learn about data trees, you'll understand. If these numbers are four in numbers, and these are, I guess, five, yeah, five in numbers, which means they're at a different depth, and hence they are not able to interact with each other to the extent that you want them to be. So how do we fix this? There is shift path, yeah. just keep them as they are, shift path by a value of, by default it's minus one. So let's see what it gives me if I just define minus one as the input. It gives me a flattened list, but it, it does make sense towards this end where there are four zeros here and four zeros here. The drawback over here is that it's all a flattened list. So one thing that we can do is to shift it by minus two so that it, it reduces down to three. And then we graph it again. So that the four zeros are maintained here with resonance with the other list as well. Hence, we can disconnect the scale component and add the graph tree as the input to get the loft between the surfaces. Again, I cannot go in deep with all these concepts for now because they are, they are very complex to explain this short span of time. I'm sure there would be certain things available online for you guys to just brush up on those uh, on those fronts. But uh, yeah, this is what we have created by now. And uh, if I just add a panel, there are these surfaces in the drafted list that if I just, um, I can flatten them and do a loft between them. And under options, right click loft options, I can close loft. Close loft and come with changes. It will create the whole shape like that. All right. So yeah, this is this is in a way the form that we've created. There are certain aspects towards it. If I if you look at the script that I initially created, there were certain things where it was thinner over here and thicker over here. These require more interventions, which are very particular towards how you want to design it, like your, your, your intention towards designing it. I'm trying to cover the major concepts around it and hence I won't go into the complexities of it. And yeah, I could do this or I could shift list and we could just use flat rather than right click and flat. Okay, so we got a flatten tree, shift list by minus one is fine. And draft this. Let's see if I can make use of it. To create the lock between consecutive places. Okay. I might need to graft it again so as to create the four zeros here and four zeros here before we do the lock between consecutive places. Okay. 
Okay, there's a bit of a difference. Mm, I understood. So yeah, the path doesn't match on these fronts at the second value and over here, and hence we cannot go with this as of for now, but rather what we can do is use the flatten list and see what it does if we try and match it. So, okay. Yes, again, I would have to use shift path to minus one, or I guess minus two, yeah. and then graph it. Two zeros, two zeros, zero one, zero two, fine. And this goes here, let's do the input for loft, the other one. And I get separate set of uh, lofts that I can cap holes. All right, let's do it like that. And let me just hide preview for everything else. So this is what we have created. And I can hide everything else at the back. Right. All right. So basically what we have looked at is how to use the basic concepts around what to do when you want to do, but also around what are the complexities that you need to look at, work at while working within Grasshopper. But you know, you can say that it's very, very complex to understand these concepts probably for those who have already tried to understand data trees or other things, but you know, in order to save your time and to manage complexities, you need to work around on the other end so as to uh, basically um, leverage the power of parametric design because you're majorly working with data. And if you don't know how to manage data using list operation, data tree operations and the certain extents where the mathematics is involved, it's most likely that it will be difficult for you to uh, leverage the full power of Grasshopper. That's where the people who are onto the basic level would be able to create a parametric script. But in order to ideate something from scratch and take it to the next level to design something like this, and also after this level fabricated, requires a good understanding of all the concepts and try to what should I say, the, the interlink between all the concepts to make use of certain parts of data tree list operations, uh, components, parameters within Grasshopper to create something like this. So yeah, this is what it is for now. This we have created the form for now. And we'll take a quick two minute break. In this, anyone can ask me a question if there is any, if, if there is any. And uh, after this, we'll be getting into how we can, you know, uh, fabricate these parts, not actually fabricate, but how can we take the model and make it in a way where it could be used to create laser cutting file and then assembling it back to the site with each member being numbered uh, specific to their location on the model. This is where the computational aspect of it can make your life easier, just so that you can take it out ahead in the fabrication. Any questions, anyone? Mm -hmm. All right. I guess there are no questions. And uh, at least conceptually, you are aware of the the level of understanding you need to have to use grasshopper to this extent where you can design anything that you want to with the right information and knowledge that you have okay so now i'm going to just use a list item onto this 
since it's a grafted list it's selecting everything i need to flatten it once i do i can see that i have selected one member out of this whole family and this is what it is in terms of the, the first entity in the list which has six faces if i just select it it has six faces and i can further deconstruct it into its constituent parts and use it for assembly and you can if, if you know good enough grasshopper you can also define the junction details how they interact how do they do they uh, have the joinery details and everything to an extent where it can be easily fabricated as individual members initially and then assembled at the side where the common group joint or not hold or something could come up together to hold these members together but that's a different level of volume altogether uh, within grasshopper okay so i have this entity which is as the gap hole over here I can now take it forward to deconstruct the rep further so as to get I, so that I get the individual faces. And I'll just quickly move on to this it as I can see that there is just 10 minutes remaining for the stipulated time. So once I do this, I can extract all the six faces of each of these zero to five that means six spaces of each of these constituent members all right the six faces that i have for each one of them all right just give me a second um, All right. Okay. Oh, great. I guess Afridi is following. That's great. So Afridi, I'll let me know where do you want to follow up till? Which part from where? You can unmute yourself and uh, uh, let me know. Because, you know, if I zoom out too much, you won't be able to read. I need to frame it within the part of it. Is this good enough? Fine. Yeah. Okay. What we can do is at the end of this session, for those who enrolled for this, I can share the grasshopper script across as well so that for those who have missed out on something and probably don't want to go through the whole video a lot you can just follow the script if you are already aware of intermediate concepts i'll see if i if we can give out the high resolution image or we can give out give out the the original grasshopper file that we try to do. okay so let me know when it's done from your end script will be great all right I guess, yeah, that will help for those who are trying to study on their own. Yeah, I cannot expect every one of you guys to do it right in the session, but at least you guys can participate and understand and ask questions if you have. Like, you can also say, what if this happens? Like initially, you guys were asking. But once the concept complexity of the form increased, <laughs> I guess, yeah, yeah, at that point of time, you were like, what should I, what should I uh, do here? Don't worry, we will share across the relevant steps okay so we have this form i can just hide it preview off and i just need the faces so i will use surface or i'll use beer let's see whichever one that i need now whichever these Faces were in a club of six, 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 six are now individual faces um, when they are deconstructed that you can see in this panel. The first brick, I would call it brick, the first unit had six faces and that's what you can see here. If I want them all to be in one 
particular format, let's say, in one single list, I just need to right click to this and flatten it, or I can use flatten component, flatten tree, which will give me one single list with path is equals to zero and all of them aligned one after the other uh, in this format. Great. All right. So once we do the flatten tree, I can first find the center point of it and try and use them these members to relocate to their location where let's say on the ground I've created a grid of rectangle where a grid of rectangle, each rectangle has one face with their names into it. I wanted to use certain plugins, but I want to also touch upon the concept of regardless of plugin, if you were to start and do it on your own, what is it that it requires to do it? Like I, I guess there was this uh, plugin called Open Nest. Yeah, that can help you do that. And there is Fox as well, which I initially mentioned. It must be somewhere. There are too many plugins on my screen. I don't want you guys to feel overwhelmed with it. So let's get with it. I need to find the same plane that we initially found on the surface to extract the normal direction for uh, extruding the line. So I'll use the evaluate surface. Each one of these surfaces are being evaluated. I need to make sure that it is reparameterized. And an MD slider is what we would be adding to it. Now each of these faces would have this planes, which will work like a reference of where to pick this, these faces and where should I place them. All right. So, okay. I have these. I would now want to create a space where I can pick these up and place it. So let me create a rectangular array. So for those who are feeling like it's getting over, over the time, don't worry, we'll, we'll wrap it up in the next 15, 10, 15 minutes. So array, I would use rectangular array with the geometry being a rectangle, plane, I'll use a point somewhere in this space. There is my x axis, let's send that. I'll keep it here. Rectangle with a value of 500 by 500. And this becomes my geometry. And the cell. Uh, define what is the width and height. Okay, so x count, y count. Mm, let's say this is 500 by 500. All the, okay. the cell requires width and height. So, okay. so the x count, let me just give out 50 by 50. And this I guess requires a domain. Um, let me just check. Construct domain. Will work? No. Do, do, do. Cell size has to be rectangle. It has to be a rectangle. Okay, the same rectangle goes in. Yeah, I was confused on those terms. Now the x and y count, I could just make it linear as per the number of number of um, surfaces that I have, the, the, the things that I want to unroll and keep it on the ground. Or I can just check how many number of faces that I have using uh, list length and using the values that this component gives out, 600, I can just Square with this because we are working in uh, rectangles. Square the root. I guess, yeah, probably I might need to not use square root, rather divide. I'm sure. So if these are 600 in count, 
x count is 50 by 50. So yeah, I would need to do the, the square root of it. Yeah, 2500. We don't need 2500, we need 600 of these and hence I'll just use square square root and add it to the panel, it says 24 point xyz. Let me just round this off. And the ceiling is what I'm going to use as the number of x and y count. All right, so there are these number of number of uh, rectangles that I have, which is equivalent to there's something called parameter that we can use, say 625. It's more than what we need, but it will accommodate 600 of these plane, the, the surfaces onto the grid. And I can find the point within the rectangle at the center, which is using area, or I can create a surface and find the plane, whichever works fine for you. I've got the, the points and I can create a XY plane on this. So I've got where to pick up from, where to place my object, and there is something called orient as the component, which requires what you want to place at what location, picking up from where, and it has to go where. So I am going to pick it up from this particular location as the plane, which is the frame source. The target is on the grid, which is the which are these grid. Finally, I now need to give the geometry. Now, before I give that, I need to ensure that I have grafted all the, the input values. Otherwise, it will be a chaos and your file might just get stuck at a given point. And I should also, before doing anything around this, I should save my document. Otherwise, it will be a nightmare. Okay, so I have these faces that I now need to pick up and place on the ground. And now, as you can see, using a simple command like orient, I can place all these faces, which otherwise would have taken a lot of while to pick up individually and place it around onto each grid and then name it and number it and uh, try to assemble them back would take a lot of while. Now, it's just a part where we have moved it to a certain extent. Now, we also need to refer it back when we number it and then get it back to assembled on site, right? Wherever our form is supposed to be installed. So based on the number of entities, I can create a text that can be attached to each of these planes, uh, each of these surfaces at the center. Let's say I want to number this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so on and so forth till the 600th entity. And I also want to number it at the object that I have so that I can come back to my Rhino screen and refer back to which number of entities follow in what format. So what you can probably do while working with this kind of an example is start with the zero to six, zero to five number of surfaces uh, and basically create that single module. And once you have all the modules, whichever the numbers are, 200 or something, 100, 200, you then assemble them back together. Yes, there could be details like creating the, the uh, flaps that you can create around it and try and extrude them back. Uh, so that like when you do paper modeling, when you want to join two faces, you try and extract the edges as such where you have the flaps. So something like this 
where each of these members have a flap, which can then connect with the consecutive member around it with certain holes, or you can use glue or something, or nut bolts or something like that. All this is possible, but then it will take another half an hour or so for me to just quickly do it without explanation. You know? So we don't get into that uh, part here. And then you'll find a lot of resources around it on the internet. Once you've created the faces, how you can go about uh, basically getting that exact shape of uh, members to join in. All right, so let's quickly create a series component where the length, the list length is going to be a part of it and it goes as the count. What this does is that based on the start value, which is zero and keep on adding one till the time we have values from zero to 600, right? This count defines how many times you want to repeat, repeat 0, 1, 2, 3, 0 plus 1, 1, 1 plus 1, 2, 1, 2 plus 1, 3, so on and so forth. That becomes our numbering 600 times. And this is what we are going to place at the center of it as a marking of each of these entities. Now you imagine when you would be doing this manually on your own, texting, you know, numbering each entity out of it and trying to export, you know, uh, get it right and someone some other day says to you oh I don't need 200 members I don't have the budget I just need 100 members you know I don't need 100 I just have budget for 50 you would spend the whole night again and do it right so that is one of the nightmares that working with these complex forms I don't see myself doing with any other primitive tool like such or autocad like that and it, actually saves your time and gives you more freedom towards design and think around that. All right, getting back. So I need to create a text, which is not this one. I'll just use a simple one. Yeah, it requires a location. So the location of the rectangular array's center point is where I want to go with, or I can use the plane as well. The text is going to be the series input and yes there is a small text at the center i guess yeah and if i just size it up to 5.00 probably yeah i can see there is this text with, with flat lines which can be used for etching or something let's see what happens if i just break it yeah so this way zero and one and two these are very simple straight lines that can easily etch etching if you would have used your laser cutting models uh, for contouring or creating vertical contours or something onto a form these are very very important otherwise you won't be able to identify which member is supposed to be at what location so i'll just select these uh, numbers that are oops. I need to not delete the point. And then, yeah, uh, use it. One thing that I should do is to internalize this point so that it doesn't depend on the Rhino point anymore. All right, so I've got my text at each location. I've got my surfaces. I can deconstruct them again. Deconstruct direct because these are surfaces and just keep the edges and join them because for laser cutting you need the curve not the surfaces and yes you have your particular form with their particular numbering as to which member is located where and what you need to do with it following the similar lines you can even number them on to these individual uh, members as well so Every time you want to install it and assemble it, you can revert back to your model basically. And if I could just bake these, for now I'm just baking it up for if I just you know bake them up along with the rectangular grid. This is what we get. Right? 
So you can export the file and uh, export selected to DWG and AutoCAD drawing and name it whatever you want it to be. And once you open it in AutoCAD, extra, extract the, you can ex, you know export it for the CNC cutting and use it for your uh, you know, in pavilions installation as an assembly. All right, so this is it from the, the point of view where you get an idea about the, the pavilion and also the processes involved while working with these complex forms. Yes, I would agree with some of you where you are feeling like it's too much to grasp in this short, of, short span of time, but then in order to have the right power to work with parametric tools, you have to step up and make yourself, make yourself uh, compatible enough with the knowledge that it requires for you to use it the way you want it. It gives great control, but it requires a lot of effort in going around and uh, trying out different things on your server. Any questions, anyone? All right. Over to you, Arath. Perfect. So thank you, Kamaljit, for your demonstration. I think everybody will be uh, taking a lot of uh, use from this uh, expertise from you, uh, primarily because of the understanding of how computational design actually works, right? Like the on-hands experience with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, now that we have finished with the demonstration, I want to ask what's next? Like what happens after this? Well, if you want to start developing your own expertise into computational design, we have something prepared for you, which is the Master Computational Design course. Here, you will be able to learn all the things about computational design and multiple workflows and software that will allow you to insert yourself into this growing market. We have a global community of experts and mentors who are joining us to aid into this process. Some of them, you may have already seen them if you have checked out the previous webinars, like for example, Giuseppe Dotto, and just a sneak peek, uh, you will also be seeing all of these mentors in future webinars in the coming month so right so just stay tuned for that in the social media ones to x uh like i said we have uh, many people from all over the world who help you understand how computational design works and give you a real world experience on this emerging market so up until this point like i mentioned in the beginning we're going to open up the uh q a we're going to take uh, maybe two questions live and we can go ahead and end the session. So I'm going to allow uh, you guys to open up your mics. Just give me a second here. There you go. If you have any question, please open up your microphone and we'll answer it, all right? Let's see some questions. Um, well, somebody is asking me here in a direct message uh, if we're going to be sharing some kind of handouts or some kind of uh, documents uh, after the session. We're going to be sharing the script, correct, Kamaldi? I think yeah. you're muted. Yeah, we can share the script. No worries. It's just that we need to figure out how to how would it reach out to you. Probably those who subscribed for the session and those who showed up, we'll take your list and the email and it will try and send it across to you on the mail itself. Perfect. So I want to know here, uh, Jorge Gutierrez, Emmanuel Mascan, do you have any questions? Uh, Yemi, Iram? Well, if we don't have any questions to be answered live, I will thank you guys once again for joining us in this webinar. Uh, I think uh, there's a couple of questions there. Yeah. Are these time consuming? How much time of practicing to get to a reasonably good modeler? All right. 
Okay, so I'll take this question up first. So that's yeah. your question. So your question is, are these time consuming, like working within Grasshopper, you mean, like in order to get these designs and forms and execute it? Is that your question? Yeah. So any new skill that you take, initially it takes quite some time because it's not the regular way if you just look at how it has evolved. We started with just replicating the workflows of hand drafting and creating things from, from hand drafting to AutoCAD and then to 3D modeling within BIM. Uh, and also computational was developing, computational tools were developing parallelly. Yes, it takes certain efforts, but once you understand the basics and fundamentals, you can evolve into processes uh, around it where you might want to deviate into specializations as what we provide in our uh, master's computational design course as well which in in order to just create the form it's doable taking a time let's say if you just invest a uh, few hours every day it can take let's say four to five months and then you brush up on your skills you get to know new, new concepts and then you try and permit it and combine it around it to explore stuff but yeah it does take time and it also takes a lot of cognitive ability to think on those direction being able to copy something from YouTube and try and replicate it is easy because what you're doing is basically dropping component and connecting wire within Grasshopper. But once it comes to design something, you need to in depth understand what is happening, why it is happening, why am I doing it? I tried my best explaining in this example, in this pavilion on why am I doing, what am I doing and how does it help? Yes, given that you don't know what is graphed, what is flattening, what is reparameterized XYZ, once you were aware of it, let's say, it would be easy to understand what is happening. Yeah. So if you brush up on those certain concepts, you would get to at least to creating the form. But to take it to the next level, you need certain more expertise of how actually these build forms are built to life and brought to realization. Perfect. Thank you, Kamal, for that. Um... So yeah, I think there's no more questions from the audience. I want to thank you guys once again for joining us and remind you that you can check the recording of this webinar in the, the YouTube page of one is 2 x And of course, if you have any further questions, you can reach out to us in Instagram and LinkedIn. And also the experts here at one is 2 x will be reaching out to you in case you have any questions to make sure that none of your uh, queries go unanswered, all right? So thank you guys so much. Uh, I think we can... Uh, take that last question, Kent, uh, in order to, to be assessed by the expert, correct? And there we go. So yeah, uh, we're gonna be reaching out to you, Adam, with that question, all right? So thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see each other in the next one, all right? Thank you, Kawadi. Thank you, see you guys around, bye. See you guys. Mm-hmm.